Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. Hi, and welcome back to a fresh episode of Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm delighted to be joined by Toucan Das today. Toucan is a CEO over at Leadsift. Um, Leadsift provide companies with B2B intent leads that you can action immediately. Toucan, a warm welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Good. How are you? Yeah, all, all good, thanks. So excited to, to jump in, Toucan. I know today we're going to be talking about that data lists are dead. Um, and how people can utilize intent data to be able to generate hot B2B leads. Um, so we'll share plenty of actionable tips, what intent data actually means, how we can leverage that, and um, why we don't need to go down the traditional route of actually kind of using outdated data sheets, hoping that our prospects are going to be on the end of the line or the end of an email, and then um, realizing that a lot of the data is actually out of date, probably bringing it through to the wrong person, all these kind of things that us as sales professionals or business owners absolutely hate. Um, so we're excited to jump into that and um, really give the audience today some juicy tips on how they can get hot leads with their ideal customers and a B2B atmosphere. Before we get to that, Tukun, perhaps you can give us a quick snapshot on your background um, and why you set up Leadsift. And I know you um, you started as a technical founder and you, you, you've kind of merged into a sales role. So perhaps you could give us a, a quick intro on that and, and some of your background, sir. I'm still figuring out what role I have merged into, uh, but uh, I my my, my name is Tukan. I am the CEO and co-founder of Leadsef. Background is in computer science. Specifically, uh, my, my master's thesis was around natural language processing and, and data mining. Um, so that's, that's, that's my background and started Leadsef eight years ago with, with, a, with a couple of my co-founders. And the whole idea for us starting Leadsef was we, we realized there's a ton of valuable information that was out there on the web, publicly available, that could be used for a business to better engage their customers. So that was the whole thesis that we started Leadsept on. And, okay. and the reason we did it was because we were data, data scientists, we could automatically extract some of these signals at scale and pass it over to the uh, business owners so that they can use that to go, at, oops, sorry. So uh, all the technical difficulties, so that they can go <laughs> ahead and, and reach out um, better to their 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 buyers. Um, so that's it, how man. the Leadsip journey started. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And how was the transition? Because I know before we, we started recording, you said it was quite a tran tricky transition going from the technical side, obviously being a data analyst, and then merging that in to be able to actually sell the, the services, the, the products, the software that you guys offer. So how did you find that stepping stone? Rough. Uh, <laughs> so, so as a technical founder, there are a few things, right? Um, First thing is, um, one of the things we, we had was, we, we had this belief that if you build, they will come. Uh, and a lot of technical people have that belief. It's like, we'll build some cool things and some people will come because it's super cool. Look, all the fancy things we did. Um, so that was a big mistake and lesson learned. Um, so that was, that, that was one of those things we learned. The other thing was um, being a tech founder we are more comfortable writing code, doing research and, and all that stuff. That's, that's what we are trained on. That's what, sure. that's our comfort zone. And we, we sort of hide behind a hired salesperson or a marketing person, expecting them to automatically sell a half baked product early on. Um, so that was also a massive mistake and lesson learned. And it has got nothing to do with um, the quality of the salesperson. You can have the world's best salesperson. But when you're starting off, um, when your product is barely just a glorified, minimal viable product, you cannot expect someone else to sell it for you. You as a founder, you need to be out there selling, um, selling the vision, uh, sharing your passion, um, getting the feedback from the customers, passing it back to the product team so they can iterate fast. Um, so those were some of the lessons learned being a tech founder, uh, trying to build a B2B SaaS startup. 
Awesome, man. And I really respect that. I mean, there's there's a lot of times where salespeople get the rough end of the stick and they're, they're often the first first people to blame. It's like, oh, we didn't hit revenue target this month. Automatic, let's blame sales. And like you say, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're saying, look, it's, especially for startup companies, you need to work together. You need to collect customer feedback. You need to understand that you might be starting with a, a minimum viable product and that things might not always work 100%. And uh, it sounds like you, you understood that and you understood that you already need to chip in and sort of work together to make things happen rather than just relying on one or two salespeople to, to hit the magic numbers. 100%. And I, to be honest, uh, uh, and not being overcritical, but I understood it too late. Uh, ah. But 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 that's absolutely true. Um, you cannot, it's not a salesperson's fault. I mean, early on, I mean, yeah, you, you have to sell it. Until and unless you've figured out the process, you have a good idea of what are the normal objections, what ICP fit works, and you have sort of built a repeatable process, a very basic version of it. That's when you bring in your sales first salesperson, let them prove it out, then bring the second one and scale from there on. Love that, man. But that's that's the case quite often. We quite often learn from our, our mistakes and things like that. And it's, whilst it's rough at the time, I'm sure it's, it's helped you out in the long oh, term. Yeah. All right. All right, dude. So excited to, to talk about intent data. Why um, traditional data, data list rental or data list purchasing is is no longer the way to go. So if we could start off, um, perhaps too, can you give us an explanation of what intent data actually is? Yeah. So intent data is is, I mean, in the recent times, at least in the B two B space, it's one of the hottest buzzwords, and it, it it is it is becoming a category of its own. It has a lot of traction behind it. But let's. I still see there's a lot of misconception around what intent really is. So if, if I had to unpack and say what intent data means, intent at its at its core basically means the probability of a person or a company needing your product or services at any given time. That's all intent is, at least buying intent. A company okay. needing your services uh, or solution at a certain given time. That's all intent is. Now, because it, it is around someone buying your solution, obviously sales and marketing people are always looking for that. That's the holy grail. Now, now the reality is when you're looking at intent, at least in a B2B, there is not a single source of intent that can guarantee tell you, hey, hey Sam, you know, this company is gonna buy your cybersecurity software in the next 30 days. There is none. I wish, I wish was, man. I'd, yeah. Yes, me too. I'd be a multi-billionaire selling that data. Um, so there, there isn't. So we need to we need to understand that. But in the absence of that, uh, what there is, there are interesting signals or proxies, if you may, that can help you assign a probability of a company uh, to be more likely in the buying journey for your solution. Can they buy in the next? you know, three days or 30 days? Yes, absolutely. But can they not buy it in the next six months? That's also possible. But there's a higher likelihood of them being receptive to your message because they're uh, in market. So that's really what intent data helps you do. Um, so we need to educate the market around this expectation because a lot of the times people think, all right, you're telling me these 100 people have shown intent, 90% of them will book a meeting with me, 50% of the 90 will then close, right? That number worked. I wish that was the case that doesn't happen. It could happen only if these 100 people have shown intent on your website. They have come to your okay. website, looked at your pricing, booked a meeting, uh, requested a demo, requested a quote. Yes, that form of intent is very strong. They're coming to your website and asking specific information. Sure, so to dive into this a bit deeper, Tukan, um, sure. So what, what is the difference? Perhaps this would be a co comparison. What's the difference between, like you mentioned there, an inbound lead? So if someone comes onto our website, they request a consultation, they request a quote or a demo or something like that, that, of course, is an inbound inquiry for us. Um, or what's what's actually intent data? Is, is there a comparison between the two on, on how they weigh up? Absolutely, yes. So there is there is two kinds of intent. One is what we call first-party intent. That is basically people showing some form of interest or buying intent on your own properties. That could be someone picking up the phone and calling you saying, hey, Sam, I heard about your software. I'm interested in buying. That's intent. That's 
and no one else will have that information outside of yourself. None of your competitors, no, none of your partners. Same thing. Someone came to your website, you know, visited a few pages, read your blog, downloaded your webinar, or you know, listened to your podcast and went away. That is also intent. That is only with you. Uh, that's that's great. But the challenge there is less than uh, five percent of your total addressable market is coming to your website. The rest are not visiting your website. They're out there. They're doing activities. They're learning from your competitors, industry peers, influencers, but not necessarily coming to your website. What intent data in, in all intensive purposes, the intent data players talk about, including Litsif, is that 95% that's not calling you, not emailing you, not coming to your website, filling out a form. These are the people that are doing things on the outside world. That's where intent data comes is surfacing which of these 95% of your total addressable market that's out there, uh, which one of them should you go after? Got it, man. Okay. So perhaps you can share with us too, can some examples of how us as business owners or sales professionals or marketers can get our hands on this juicy data. So like you say, only about 5% of our addressable market, if that, are actually going to ever inquire with us or get in touch with us through our website or through our landing pages or through other whatever digital or offline marketing we're doing to bring in those leads. So how can we leverage intent data? What are some, some tips we can actually do to, to make use of that, to tap into it? And um, yeah, perhaps you can, you can give it us for, for a starter and then we can sure. talk about how we can harness that and, and make best use of it to generate leads. Yeah, um, definitely. Let's, let's take the example for, for this case. Let's say you are a cybersecurity software company um, and you have a big sales development team, you have a bunch of prospector sales folks that are trying to prospect. Um, the first thing that you need to do is um, you need to have a good idea of who your total addressable market is. You know, companies of certain size, certain buyer persona, certain regions, certain industries. You have that pad down. Now let's talk about intent. Uh, let's go a level below of intent. Let's talk about certain intent signals, because as I said, there is no one form of intent. There is multiple levels and multiple types of intent. And I'll talk about some of them. And I'll talk also about how you can get some of this yourself manually. Um, so if you are a cybersecurity software company and if you see people talking on a LinkedIn post, whether it's a LinkedIn Pulse article or a LinkedIn post that talks about endpoint security. What if you knew all the people that are commenting, liking on that video or content that was published on LinkedIn, as an example, those are people that you should be paying attention to because they're showing interest in the last two days about something that your software does. What becomes interesting is let's say there's 200 people that liked or commented, maybe 50 of them, and I'm just throwing an arbitrary number might be in engineering or IT role. And okay. out of those 50 that are in IT or engineering, 25 of them fit your ideal customer profile. Those are 25 great people at different companies that you can reach out to. Can Will they be buying your software right now? I don't know. But the fact that they are engaging with end, a content about endpoint security and it happened in the last 48 hours, is a pretty good chance to stop of mind. At least it will be resonating with them rather than you go after every 20,000 other uh, IT or engineering professionals, let's go after this 25. So that's an example of an intent signal that you can very easily get. Okay. So it's, it's, it's for, to me, correct me if I, I'm wrong, but it's, it sounds like it's understanding when your ideal customer profile. So um, perhaps in, in my case, you use the cybersecurity example, but in our case at WebChoice, as a digital marketing company, we're often working with, on smaller end of the scale, business owners direct. And then for larger okay. scale companies, it might be marketing directors or head of marketing or um, chief marketing officers or whoever whoever's involved in the sales process. So let's say there was a piece of content, the, a video that was out on um, how to improve website conversion rates to generate more leads or SEO, perhaps it's one of the services. And then- sure. This intake data showed us that someone that fit our ideal customer profile comments on this saying, this is really interesting, I'd like to learn more, or something like that. And then we'd be able to leverage that data to start a conversation with them, would we? Or how would it work from Absolutely. there? Absolutely, yes. Just think about it. So let's let forget cybersecurity. Let's talk about digital marketing. There was a video about SEO or how to improve website conversion. And you saw you know, a bunch of people that have engaged with that content. And as I said, 
maybe 25% of them are business owners or marketing directors. These are people that are showing interest about a topic that you care about. I would, the first thing that I would do is I would get these people, get their contact details, email, LinkedIn, whatever information. I would do, you know, a prospect thing saying, hey, you know, this is what we do. I think you're interested in, in this topic. Uh, would love to give a free consultation or something, but just love to know how you're trying to do conversion rate optimized currently and how, how much better we can do as an example, right? So that's a classic example of you taking some data and reaching out to these business owners or marketing directors, knowing that they or someone from their company was, you know, showing interest about a topic that your service addresses, right? Let's, let's take it a step further. Another kind of intent is you guys have competitors. There are other digital marketing agencies or services that do that. What if one of your digital marketing services publishes a webinar and you see a bunch of people share that webinar, talk about their webinar on Twitter or some forum or, 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 or product hunt or something like that. That's great. The fact that they're talking about your competitor or even let's say SEM rush or S or Moz, they're not competitors, but they're complementary companies. Sure. Then showing interest about a technology that is complementary to you gives you an interesting indication that, huh, they might be thinking about SEO. They might be doing analytics and I can, I can, they're more likely to be attuned to what I'm offering than someone completely cold where I have no information. So those are two couple very basic information signals, intense signals or trigger events or whatever you really call it that you can leverage to go after your prospect rather than buying a list of all business owners in North America. That makes um, sense? Yeah, so so the second point was kind of understanding where your idle customers are interacting with either your competitors, so any any competitor in, in your industry, or even yep. you mentioned Moz, which is obviously an, an SEO based tool, um, to actually using tools that are relevant to the services you provide. So when they're engaging with these kind of companies, you can pick up this information, and then you can you can reach out to them, I guess, with some kind of subtle outreach, just to absolutely yeah yeah yeah. Is, is there an outreach that you'd recommend? Because I guess you yeah. can't be too strong because they probably have never heard of your company. So you are, whilst whilst the the prospect isn't as cold as a, a total cold outreach because you can you can then research them once you know their info. Is, is there a so good there, way to approach these? There is certainly a, a good way to approach it, but before the good way, I'll tell you there's, there's certainly a bad way to approach sure, it. Sure. It's basically reaching out to them saying, "Hey, I noticed you were looking at my competitor's webinar. By the way, we do this." That's certainly a, a bad way to do it. So one of our customers <laughs> suggested, and, and we have learned this, is make it like a coincidence that you happen to reach out to them at the right time. Um, and the way you leverage that intent signal is if you know they're talking about you know, website converse optimization, your reach out would be about that topic. You might do multiple digital marketing services, but in this case, when you're reaching out, you're gonna reach out talking about website conversion optimization, not, you know, uh, landing page design or something like that, right? Got it. So that those are so you make it look like it's coincidence, make it timely, make it relevant, short, with a very clear call to action. So just um, yeah, it sounds like just personalization, making it super relevant to what that person was actually looking at at the time. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So it's timing. The intent signals gave you the timing and 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 the contact. Now you're going to add some context to it and reach out. Um, Got it, so, so. Now that you start thinking about it, there are some, let, let's, let's go, let's dig into a few other interesting signals that you can relatively easily get. What if, uh, as a digital marketing services, you saw um, them recently install um, a Facebook pixel on their website. Let's say you do paid media services. I don't know if you do that, or let's say you do, you know, SEO optimization. And let's say sure. you see them starting to use SEO malls. Or, or like um, or SEM rush or, or any of them, right? That's an interesting signal for you to say, oh, they have started recently starting buying paid media. They're they're doubling down on uh, on on SEO analytics. So even if I have not seen any of their employees research about you know my competitor or talk about website optimization, the fact that they are using these tools or started using these tools in the last thirty days might be an interesting trigger for me to reach out to them because it's my services are orthogonal or complementary to what they are doing. It's a good timing to be. Now imagine this, you cross reference that with an engagement. So let's say you found out they started using uh, Facebook uh, ads recently on their website. 
in the last sure. 30 days. And a week ago, you saw them talk about how to better optimize your paid media. And they're engaging with the content about paid media on some channel. Coupled with those two signals, now you have a lot more information about them saying, I know they're starting to run paid paid campaigns and their marketing director was talking about or you know engaging with content around um, uh, paid media on B2B. Boom, you now have more likelihood or more context um, to reach out to them and the likelihood of them engaging back goes up a lot higher because again, it's all about timing and relevancy, right? Yeah, man, I love that. So it's uh, a combination of things, it sounds like. So that the latest point was using these actual buying signals to understand when people in the market, if they're spending money on something that's similar to what you do, it, they may well be in the market to, to buy your service if it's, if it's slightly right. different than what they're spending money on. And then combining various signals. So if they've showed intent for, in, in our example, paid ads or search engine optimization tools, then they might be looking at your product. And if they've engaged on a different piece of content, say on LinkedIn, then you know that they're they're probably pretty interested in this this service, so it might be a great time to reach out. Let absolutely right. So let me add a couple more layers to this example. Please. Now, what if what if you found out that the same company was in the last week they po put out a posting about for a paid search director? That's a pretty interesting point. The fact that they are hiring for a paid search director or director of paid media, again, very interesting, right? So now you're, you're buying the, that company's intent score or buying propensity, likelihood of buying is going up. Again, you do not know that they are going to buy or not. Absolutely not. But sh if you had this information and as a salesperson, should you reach out to them? Damn right. Right. So this is you're, you're layering in other pieces of information. Keep in mind, all of this data is publicly available. There's no secret or you know, backdoor type of, type of data collection. You're just looking at signals that are available online to pick up this. Um, now let's, let's go another step further. Let's look at another kind of signal. The same company, their director of digital marketing, probably three months ago, attended a podcast like this and was talking about that they're doubling down on their marketing efforts for 2021. What if you knew that information? What if that data was collected? You now know they're investing on that. They're hiring for a paid media director. They started using Facebook ads, using SEM rush. Now you have a very good picture of what this company is, what are their needs, who to talk to, right? Um, so so that's that's what I mean when I think of intent is intent is there's no one single source. I wish there was. And but if you start looking at different pieces of disparate information and if you put them together, it it becomes uh, it becomes very, very interesting for you to go ahead and, and prospect. Yeah, in my mind, it almost sounds like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. So, 100%. Knowing, yeah, exactly. So knowing when the timing is right, and not just waiting for one small, in your like you were saying, trigger event or buying signal, but waiting for perhaps several. So they might have engaged on content on LinkedIn. They might be looking at a tool. They might have started buying something similar. And they might advertise, like you said, that they're, that they're advertising for, for someone that's actually going to help with the service that you offer. And then you know the timing's right. Everything, all the ducks in a row. Now's the time to, to craft that cold email, pick up the phone, or however you want to outreach to them on LinkedIn, whatever your channel is, and, and start a conversation, it sounds like. Is that about right? Absolutely, yes. I, and I, I sometimes joke is, you know, uh, when you're prospecting, if you have all these triggers, you should you, you, you need to be thinking like a detective. There are all these puzzles out there, trails that are left behind the companies. If you pay yep. close attention, you can pick up these clues and build a picture about who to go after. So think like Sherlock Holmes and, and, and whoever, <laughs> and then Love go it. after these accounts. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Okay. So, okay, we've covered some great stuff. Um, in terms of intent data itself, Tukan, how can everyone tune in and get their, get their mitts, get their hands on this kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, um, at LeadSift, we are an intent data provider where we collect all the different signals that I mentioned and more and a you know, dozen more signals. By looking at public web, we, our crawlers extract this data, you know, and then every morning in your CRM, literally you log in and you get a list of accounts and contacts for you to go after based on all the triggers we picked up in the last 24 hours. Um, so that's what LeadSip does ourselves. We, we typically go after companies that do have a defined process. They have a marketing and demand gen person. They have a team of SDRs that are dedicated for prospecting. They just need the right fuel for them to go after. Um, so that's, that's, that's what, that's what LeadSip does. But 
uh, as I said, some of these tools, um, some of the techniques that I said can be done manually by yourself. It just doesn't scale. If you're a small company, you're better off doing it yourself, little bit, little. And then when you have reached certain scale, like you have, you know, 50 people and you're, you have a repeatable process and you just more, want more signal for your sales team to go after marketing to nurture. Um, at that point, then you, then, then you should use, look at tools like LeadSeft um, to help you just you know, turbocharge your uh, outbound prospecting and your, your demand gen efforts. Sure, sure. So I guess, I guess, like you said, obviously your your tool can help people. It sounds very, very useful. Um, but I guess the alternative is to do it manually, is it? So to to do things like LinkedIn to to look at your ideal customers, to look at what they're engaging with content wise, and then other publicly available platforms. Um, are there any any tips, any way that we can help our audience to come with any other tools that might be useful if they are looking to get to grips with this before they're perhaps looking at a software or a solution? Um, yeah. Like this, your own. There is a tool that um, that we have seen some people use. It's called Phantom Buster. You probably are familiar with it. So okay. you can basically build a workflow using Phantom Buster and you know Trade.io or Zapier, where you can put in Phantom Buster a phrase saying, you know, are people researching about this topic on LinkedIn? You give the LinkedIn post. You have to do the finding and enter it. Phantom Buster will extract the LinkedIn. You can then use another tool from LinkedIn to get their contact details and then use another tool to tie it together and then push it to your CRM. So there are, there are, there are tools that, that you can, you know, cobble together to get some of this data, uh, pretty, pretty easily, um, even automate some of these processes. Okay. And, um, from, from my background, I'm in digital marketing now, but in, in days gone by, I have, have purchased lists or, or at the time my bosses or my managers were purchasing data lists. And you know the score. You're calling up prospects, hoping that they're they're going to be on the line. Quite a lot of the time, the information is out of date or wrong, or the the person's moved. So, why is intent data actually better than um, traditional data list or data list rental or purchasing data? Well, there are multiple reasons, right? The first reason is uh, the stat says at any given time, only three percent of your uh, total addressable market is in market for a solution like yours. That's that's sure. the number. Three percent is actively looking, and I think another twenty to thirty percent are starting to be in the buyer's journey. So, if you are buying a static list, you have no context on who is actively looking, how, and what they're looking for. So, you are basically spraying and praying and hoping, assuming the data is correct. You're hoping that these people are in need for your services. So, think about it. You know, if three percent are actively looking. 97% uh, are not, so your chances of missing the target are, are very high. As a sales development rep, you are, it, 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 it gets very, very tiring, uh, very, very fast, very demotivating. When you're reaching out, you're even the best of personalization is not going to get you any, anywhere if the timing and relevance is not right, right? So that's why static lists are, are tricky, and it, it, that's, that's the challenge. Um, static lists are good. You can take a static list of contacts, assuming they're all perfectly up to date, and then you can use intent signals to prioritize them. So let's say you have 5,000 contacts, maybe out of this 5,000, 75 of them are active in market today. Boom, those are the 75 of the uh, contact list you go after. So I, I, I would not completely throw it out of the window, but leverage, like pair your static list with some kind of a dynamic signal to, to make your prospecting smarter and more effective. Tukan, this has been great, man. We've, we've learned some great tips in terms of intent data and how we can leverage buying signals. I'd like to ask everyone that comes on, is there one thing that you think that businesses should be doing with digital marketing, Tukan, that's going to help them? Um, one thing. I, 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 I think if I, based on my experience, I think from a digital marketing perspective, I think you should think omni-channel. Uh, across every channel. So um, create your content, uh, distribute them on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, think of that. When you're prospecting, think of doing, reaching out via email, call, pair that with phone, social interaction. Um, when you're doing inbound marketing, all the people that are opening your emails, uh, people that are coming to your website, collect that data because that is intense signal. Someone opening your email three times, not replying is a signal. Bring it back. So, so omni-channel, uh, 
omnipresent basically all the time uh, and and then and then look at all the metadata that you're getting from people visiting your website people opening your emails people talking on digital channels and tie them together and then leverage that for your demand gen and lead gen efforts do not just go blind and say all right i'm targeting vps of marketing and owners in north america there's 18000 people let me blast all of them over the next 3 months that's not going to work be smarter about who you reach out to and be present all the time great stuff man everyone you've been tuning in to sam's business growth show where we sit down with business leaders experts and entrepreneurs from around the globe we find out their story how digital marketing has helped them along the way and their exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your sales and skyrocket your business so kind of if you could thank just one person either dead or alive having a positive influence on yourself and your career who would that be and why um so this person is, is dead unfortunately his name is randy posh um he is a computer science researcher and he, he he sadly passed away um because he had pancreatic cancer too early um he he did a lecture on youtube it's called the last lecture i don't know if you've heard of it um it's one hour long lecture and he eventually wrote a book about it before 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 he he died um and i think if if i had to say one single person i have not met him uh, i just randomly stumble upon it i think that that hour long video had more information life lessons uh, than i have ever collected or gotten from you know my my entire existence so i would like to thank Ray posh in in helping me shape to be the person who i am um so yeah well man you have to send us a link to to that video so we can all check it uh, out I'll send that link and I cannot recommend it enough. I cannot recommend it enough. The last Brilliant lecture. Stuff. Good stuff, Tukan. Tell us a bit more, um, a quick snapshot of your business, how people can connect with you and the best way to, to learn from yourself and get in touch. Absolutely. So LeadSafe is an intent data platform as, as you have figured out by now. Um, we are the most actionable form of intent for B2B technology companies, helping you identify which accounts and contacts to go after based on these signals of intent, as some of them I mentioned. Uh, the best way to reach out to me uh, is LinkedIn. Uh, look me up, Tukhan Das. Uh, I'm super active on, on Twitter. It's TDAS. And, and feel free to email me. It's TDAS at leadsift.com. Um, anything around you know, what tools you can use to do some of the prospecting and, and, and collect intent data, more than happy to help. And uh, if you want to know more about LeadSafe, just go to leadsafe.com, book a demo. We do actually do a personalized demo where we give you, you know, just for your time, we do give you accounts showing intent in your industry. So there is really no downside to take that meeting. Uh, so yeah. Thanks so much for coming on too. Can appreciate it, man. No, thank you for having me, Sam. It was great. Are you tired of constantly hunting for new customers? You could be missing out on regular inbound opportunities all because your website isn't on the first page of Google. Perhaps you're already spending lots of money on advertising, but your website is failing to convert all of your hard-earned visitors into a consistent flow of new customers. If you'd like to learn more about our unusual approach that brings idle clients straight to you, connect with Sam Dunning on LinkedIn or book a free 20-minute consultation via webchoiceuk.com. That's webchoiceuk.com. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales and business growth tips from the experts.